Okay, so this is the chapter where we're going to start on common stock valuation. And like I said before, this is an important chapter for your project to start understanding how to value stocks and how to put a price on what the stock is worth so you can figure out if uh, it's a stock you want to buy or sell. So the fundamental analysis, um, we could look at that in, in different approaches. One approach is the present value approach. So present value is something that you learned in a finance course or many other courses. And what we're looking at is future cash flows discounted to today's correct value. So we could say that if I'm going to buy a business, I only want to pay X amount of future cash flows for that business. And that's what I think the intrinsic value of the business is. So the, the idea is, say you were going to buy a pizza store. If you want to think of things in more simplistic terms, would you pay $100,000 for a pizza restaurant that only produced $5,000 of profits a year? No, that's ridiculous. So you see you build a relationship. If it's only going to produce $5,000 of profits a year, I'm willing to pay five times what your profits are, or $50,000 for the store. And that way, in five years, I'll pay myself back. That seems like a reasonable amount of time for the value of this restaurant. So if you're going to value anything, you value a company, you value it. And generally in the, in the finance world, we don't go with net profits because those are manipulated for tax purposes. So we like to go with cash flow, which is a pure number of what money the generate, that the business generates. So the idea is if we could estimate the future get cash flows, but future money is not the same as money today. It gets devalued through inflation. So we use the present value approach to discount the future, va the future amounts of cash flow add them all together and come up with the value today that we feel the business is worth. Now, it depends on the industry and the business. Some businesses will only sell for one or two or three times cash flow. Some businesses could sell for 25 times cash flow. It really depends on the business and its future potential, the amount, the number of times uh, the cash flow you're willing to pay for it. Because that, you know, you don't want to have too high of a number because if you buy a business 30 times cash flow, and the business is not likely to grow much, it's going to take you 30 years to pay yourself back. And that doesn't seem like an appropriate risk. But if it's a business that has extreme growth potentials, um, then maybe you would be willing to pay a higher number of multiples of cash flow because you expect cash flow to increase in the future as the business is likely to improve and become bigger uh, and more valuable. Now, the multiples of earnings approach is another way of looking at um, earnings and particularly tied to a PE value, price divided by earnings, or we call a PE ratio. And it's, you know, so it's a multiple of earnings relative to the financial performance of the company. Again, it's another approach, but here we're not using time value or money, we're really just using how many multiples sales is trading, is sales are compared to earnings or sales are compared to stock price. or uh, earnings compared to price of the stock. And these are two different approaches that we're going to talk about. So let's go back to the intrinsic value of a security. And this is just the basic formula for the present value of the future cash flows. So we would want to take each year's cash flow and divide by 1 plus k to the t. t represents time in years, and k represents uh, the cost of capital. So k can be expressed as, K can go by many, many names. K can be known as the cost of capital, the discount rate, the interest rate, uh, the required rate of return. So K can go by many um, names. But K is basically the rate um, or percentage um, that you as an investor are going to expect sort of as a return. So we want to discount that, this, you know. And if we're doing, specifically doing a discounted cash flow, we may want to look at um, the cost of capital, or the weighted average cost of capital of the company to discount the cash flows by, because that's the cost that they're paying for the money that's invested in the company that they have to finance. Uh, so you, if you're going to be owning the company, you're going to have that responsibility as well. So. K is usually thought of as a weighted average cost of capital. But in some cases, you may want to strictly look at K as an inflation rate. So if you want to discount the cash flows at the rate of inflation, 
you could do that as well. All right. And again, a lot of these models we're going to do on handout day. Okay, so discount rate. No. This is a, uh, a common terminology in present value. We have the discount rate, which we use in association with present value calculations. Um, we can also think of it as the required rate of return and a minim you know, the minimum expected rate to induce a purchase of the stock. Uh, the opportunity cost of dollars used for the investment. So basically, if you know that you can take your money and put it elsewhere at a certain rate of return, say you can get 6% relatively risk-free, and you, want to, you could use that, um, if that's your opportunity cost, you could use that as your K as well. So it's really um, to determine what you're going to use as your K input is more of a personal interest to how you are investing or what can, how conservative you want to be. Now, for corporations, when, you, when you're working, as I did for companies, and I'm valuing other companies for purchase or for mergers or you know, acquisitions, we want to look at our weighted average cost of capital. So if I'm buying another company, I'm going to use my weighted average cost of capital or my cost of capital of the funds I'm using to buy the other company to discount the cash flow out to see what my return is going to be on that money. So investors invested money with me either through stock or bonds, and there's a certain rate of return on that. And that's going to be my K if I'm going to take that money and invest it in another company, because I always want to do better than what I'm paying for my capital. And there's also the capital asset pricing model, which is a model that we've discussed in the past. It's a very common model that utilizes risk to determine the required rate of return. So if you're an investor, if you're not a corporation buying another company with borrowed capital, but you're an investor, you may want to look at calculating your required rate of return on the stock based on the risks of the stock. And this, the risk is measured primarily in this formula through beta. Now the expected, and these are just the inputs for this discounted cash flow model. So the first, the most important input, I guess, is determining what your discount rate is going to be. And that is from what perspective you're viewing or the company. As a stock, someone buying stock in a company, probably going to use capital asset pricing model. As a corporation buying another corporation, weighted average cost of capital, I'd say, would be the most um, appropriate. Now, the expected cash flow, uh, cash flow can come in a couple of different forms. If, you're, if it's a utility stock, you may want to look at dividends as your cash flow over the life of the investment. Because in a um, utility stock, they pay a high percentage of their earnings out as, di as dividends, and that's probably the best way to value a company. For other companies that may not pay dividends, you, may, you probably would want to look at just the cash flow of the company rather than dividends they pay you as, their, as the cash flow discount. And certainly, if you're a corporation buying another company, you're going to go with the, the, the cash flow of the company. So the expected, you know, expected cash flows, when I talked about the dividends, dividends are always paid out of earnings. So they're generally some percentage of earnings. And that's an important factor. So if it's a company that pays a high percentage of earnings as dividends, then you would want to use dividends as your cash flow in calculating these uh, intrinsic values. Um, if the company really doesn't pay much of a dividend out of their earnings, then you may want to look at the, the cash flow per share as your expected cash flow. So there is another factor in retained earnings. This is the amount of money that's not paid out as dividends. So when the company makes money, they can do th two things, pay dividends or retain the earnings. So the company makes a certain amount of money, they can retain the earnings, keep it, reinvest it in the company, or pay it out as dividends, or both. Take half the money for dividends, half the money for retained earnings. So retained earnings is an important uh, aspect for future growth and future dividends. So if the company doesn't reinvest and buy better equipment, buy other companies, you know, um, enhance their product lines, expand their locations, they're not going to grow much and not going to be able to support the dividends. So you always want to keep that in mind how much, so utility, they only keep enough to keep the utility operating and keep it maintained because they are contractually obligated to a particular region they can't really expand too easily. So that's why they'll pay most of their money in dividends, where a software company probably won't pay any dividends and retain all their money to reinvest and grow the company. Um, so you, in some cases, you may want to work with um, the retained earnings rather than the dividends if they pay no dividends. 
but they're going to produce a similar result um, of returns for the investor, just depending whether you're getting the cash now or you're going to get the, the money as far as the capital gains of the company later. Okay, so if we wanted to say the current value of a share of stock is the discounted value of all its future dividends, we have a number of formulas in the textbook that are, are fairly simple formulas where we basically um, discount all of the dividends into infinity if it's a perpetuity. Say like a preferred stock would be a perpetuity because a preferred stock is going to pay dividends to you forever. It never expires. So we could use a very basic uh, formula to divide the dividends by 1 plus the, um, your K, which is discount rate, to the years of discounting. It makes it easier if the dividends are all identical or if the dividends grow at a consistent rate. If you have a variable discount, a variable dividend, you're going to have to calculate each year of dividends separately and add them together. You have certain advantages if the dividend is a zero growth dividend where it's the same dividend every year like a preferred stock or if there's a constant growth in the dividend. Then we can easily factor it in a more simplistic equation. So again, um, these equations will be expressed in a handout that you get a chance to calculate. So, um, I'm just really talking going over the concepts right now. And the concept is, you know, the more dividends you get in relationship to the K, the, the lower the K, um, the more valuable the stock. The higher the K, the less valuable the stock. The higher the dividends, the more valuable the stock. The lower the dividends, the less valuable the stock. And this formula captures that equation through this division. Um, now there's some problems with these, dis, these dividend discount models. So these, they're, they're, if you're talking about dividend discount models, the big three are the zero growth dividend discount, the constant growth of the dividend discount model, and the variable model. There are three different models that handle those three situations. A, a consistent dividend, a growing dividend, and a variable dividend. But all three of these models um, have some basic problems. And one of the problems is dividends are uncertain. They're never really 100% um, locked in guaranteed. So future estimates of dividends could be f faulty at best. Uh, and the fact that dividends have been playing a smaller role and a smaller importance to the overall value of stock these days. A lot of these models were created when dividends were um, a huge aspect of stocks and what they were expected to do. Stocks were expected to generate money and pay dividends back when these formulas were created over 100 years ago. Today, in today's world, we really don't focus so much on dividends. Dividends are nice, but they're really a small percentage of our total return. We're now much more focused on the capital gains, the growth of stock price, as our main component of returns from stocks, not the actual dividends themselves. So these dividend discount models, while, in, while interesting and important piece of history and valuation of stock, are a, a lower priority or of importance on valuing stock today. But it's important to understand them and to, to uh, recognize the beginnings of valuation, these are really the formulas that they began to evaluate stocks with, to see where our starting out point is, because a lot of the ideas here were used to move forward. Now, if you're, you know, the dividend discount models are one thing, and that's the models that typically most people have problems with, and very few investment companies use these at all to value stock. However, the discounting of cash flow is quite the opposite. Using a discounted cash flow model where we discount the actual cash flows of the business for a certain amount of years to derive the value of the business is something that's a standard and used in just about all valuations of companies, specifically in investment banks looking at IPOs, uh, mergers and acquisitions, and, and things of that nature. So here again, I'm just going to go over, this is the formula for the no growth in dividends, and this would be a preferred stock. So preferred stock says we're going to pay you a dollar dividend, that's it, for, forever we're going to pay this to you, every year, forever, dollar discount, dividend. So in this case, the formula is extremely simple because there's no change in the dividend. So simply dividing the dividend by K, the, uh, the, the cost of the common stock, is expressed as a um, percentage of required return, we get the price of the stock. 
So, so very simple and used primarily only for preferred stock. Now the constant growth, and you see this model is not too difficult either, we incorporate G in the constant growth model. G represents the growth rate in the dividend, and it's a constant growth rate, meaning that a company promises to grow our dividend 5% for you know, the X amount of years in the future. Um, so we would just minus, uh, we would take K, which is, think of it as discount rate or required rate of return, and we'd minus G from it, because that's going to make K smaller, which inevitably will make the price of the stock bigger. Because think of it, the dividend's a dollar. If K's a, K's a uh, you know, say 10%, a dollar divided by 10% is $10, right? Now, if, if we had a growth rate of 5% and we take 10% of K minus the 5% of G, now we have 5% in the bottom, so a dollar divided by 5% is now a stock value of $20. So the smaller K is, the more valuable the stock price is. Uh, so if G is the growth rate of the dividend, and we're subtracting it from K, the higher the growth rate in the paid dividend, the more valuable the stock, and that makes sense. So if the stock's gonna promise 25% growth in its dividend, that's a much more valuable stock than the stock to that's going to give you a 5% growth in this dividend. So the size of G uh, in relationship to K is going to be a big factor in figuring out the price of the stock. But this, again, is a rarity. How many stocks come out and say, we have a dividend and we promise to grow it by 5% every year moving forward? I can't think of any company that currently does that. Not saying that they don't exist, but that's a rarity. So, but in the past, you know, 100 years ago, it wasn't uncommon for companies to do this. And it was sort of like a promise to get interest. And it's a great tool. Say you're, you, know, you are invested as an owner of the company, you own 20% of the shares of the company, and you want that stock price to go up, it's going to really help the stock price if you make a promise to increase the value of dividends 5% every year for the next 10 years. So suddenly the value of your stock has gone up a great deal by making that promise. Whether or not you can keep that promise is a different story. But people find value in that. Okay, so let's just take a step back and talk about K and G. And again, if this is your first exposure to some of these concepts and you're a little confused, that's fine. Just take the opportunity to note, I need to read this part of the textbook a little closely or think about this. Because you're not, it, you may not get it the first time I go over it. Or you may get it. Um, okay, so... If the market lowers the required rate of return for a stock, which is measured by K, uh, estimated value with rise. So the, reason, so the thing is, if K is smaller, that's less risk. So the value of the stock should be greater. That's basic concept here. So K is a measure of risk almost. And a large K means a lot of risk, so the stock price is going to be small. Because the riskier stocks, people are going to be cautious with. And if the K is smaller, there's less risk and the stock price should be bigger. So as risk is, think of it though, say there's a company like uh, Twitter, right now is very risky because they're not producing a lot of profits, so they have a high K. If in a few years they really nail down the way that they make money, maybe they institute a subscription base that people take on and they're willing to pay a subscription or they incorporate advertising in a way that doesn't turn off their users and suddenly make millions and millions of dollars, now the, the risk or the K for the company is gonna become smaller, the stock price will become greater. Uh, now, now let's look at G. So an investor decides that the expected growth, G as measured in growth and dividends, is gonna be higher from the result of favorable developments to the firm, they're making more money. Um, the estimated value of the company will rise as well. And that's because G is subtracted from K, which ultimately makes that, um, the effect of K smaller. So if the company is going to be likely to increase its dividends, or the growth rate of the dividends are going to be increased as measured by G, that's going to make the company more valuable. And I think you agree, companies that are going to be paying, you know, any company that suddenly said, you know, say you have uh, Microsoft, at $30 a share and they say we're going to pay a $5 dividend every year now for at least the next 10 years. Suddenly that stock is a lot more valuable than a $30 stock because you only have to hold it for six years and you get your $30 investment back if you don't factor in the time value of money. Um, so and of course the converse is two of these situations. If K increases and G decreases, the stock price is going to go down. 
So it's, and if you look at the formula, it's just the mathematics of it. Okay. So if we, let's talk about the constant growth model. Now, constant growth is a, a problem because, like I said before, dividends typically don't grow in a constant growth. You know, they're really staggered. There's no percentage of constant growth. But stocks could grow, you know, um, Stocks can grow over time, but they don't grow at a constant rate either. Stocks grow at a very variable rate. So it's, it's hard to really utilize this model in valuing stocks because we know that there's rarely a constant growth. When we're saying constant growth, we mean the exact same percentage of growth year after year. Um, but again, a lower rate, a lower required rate or a higher expected growth in dividends will raise prices. Um, so if we have a constant growth rate, we're going to expect to see the stock price increase over time as the dividend grows. And again, this is a basic equation there. Even as K remains equal. Now multiple growth rates, this is a situation that may be more realistic. It is also more difficult to calculate. And what we're saying here is that we may take a stock and break it into a couple of categories and say, if we look at the product lifespan of this particular stock, in the beginning, they're going to have you know, slow growth and then more moderate or faster growth and then slow growth, slower or growth again as it, they go from you know, initial to mature to uh, declining company. So you may want to have multiple growth rates built in into your valuation estimate um, because if you estimate right now in today's environment the company is going to come off with a very low valuation so companies not doesn't have any dividends and no profits you're going to say the company is worthless based on these models but that's not true so if you take a company like you know um, any of these internet companies in the beginning that they don't make as much profits, but then later on they make a tremendous amount. Say you take something like Netflix or Amazon. In the beginning they had losses, losses, losses. Then they started to turn the corner and make a lot of profits. Um, you would want to use a multiple growth rate strategy for a company that you have faith is going to grow and become profitable at some point. Maybe you could look at um, the electric car company Tesla. right? That right now is ramping up to be a really big car company. So if you have faith that their cars, when especially they come out the lower price cars, are going to capture 5-10% of the auto market, then you should factor that into your valuation models. And that's one reason the stock is trading so high is because people did just that. At one point the stock was trading at $40. Then people really realized, you know what, this is going to take off, this company is going to have a lot of sales. They built that into their valuation models and pushed the company up to over $200. And not, not much of the current financial fundamentals have changed. It's just that they used a variable uh, multiple growth rate scenario saying that we expect bigger things for this company moving forward. We have to start factoring that into the price. You know, it's one of the reasons that uh, Netflix is $400. It's really not, if you look at Netflix money and cash flow right now, they're not a $400 stock using any of these, these growth models. But if you factor in the, the point that uh, in the future, people are going to cut their cable boxes and, and, and unsubscribe to their cable services and probably survive on something like Netflix and other related channels. You know, think about, you know, what if Netflix suddenly was offering network TV as well, streaming as well. So basically you have all the content of Netflix plus the uh, broadcast network streaming through Netflix. Now you wouldn't need any cable, you just need the internet subscription and you get all your content. That would make it um, basically a, na a national, nationwide or global cable company, something that cable companies have a defined reach, you only have a regional reach, they can't really grow out of their uh, monopolistic region where Netflix can. So people are seeing that and they're factoring that into their valuation model. So it's, sometimes you have to be a little bit more intimate with the company than just knowing the numbers you can't just calculate the numbers, you have, to even, you have to know what is their potential growth stages. So again here, this is specifically referring to dividends and none of these companies I'm talking about pays dividends. So in that case, 
I, you, I'm talking about this also from the point of view of discounting the cash flow and projecting future cash flow for companies to be much more substantial than they currently are in, the, in some kind of multiple growth scenario. But you can also do this for dividends. So if a company was going to say, hey, right now we project, our oil prices are low, so we can only pay uh, low dividends, but we, we foresee the oil prices will be higher in two to five years, and we're going to be paying higher dividends at that point. You could use this to value, say, an oil company if, you, if they had a better estimate of their growth of their dividends. And maybe you don't, maybe oil price is too volatile. It could be something as far as volume. The oil company can say that right now we're only producing 500,000 barrels a day, but when we get this other field online in six, six months to a year and get those wells working, we'll go up to a million barrels a day, and our estimated dividends will double. Then you could use this multiple growth rate saying, you know, dividends at this predict particular production stage added to the future of the higher production stage. Okay. So let's switch over to cash flow. Now, cash flow is more realistic today than dividends. Dividends is just a classic approach, but those formulas what was used to build some more advanced valuation models today. So in your uh, valuation reports, stock analysis reports, you're not going to include the dividend discount models because nobody does that anymore. But you should include a cash flow model. And we have something called free cash flow to equity. And here we're going to look at net income plus depreciation, because we add that back, minus the non-cash, uh, the change in non-cash working capital, minus capital expenditure, minus debt repayments, plus any debt issuance. Uh, not all companies will have all these categories. Uh, however, this is just the basic uh, cash flow to equity that's in any standard accounting book or finance textbook. Uh, that, we, that one particular cash flow that we could use. We could also use free cash flow to the firm which is a slightly different cash flow calculation. Here we're taking what's called EBIT, earnings before interest and tax, and we're multiplying it by one minus the tax rate. So basically what we're saying is we're taking out the, the amount of money we'd have to pay on tax. EBIT is basically operational income. So we want to take out the tax that we would have to pay, because that's not really free cash flow if we're paying tax on that earnings. Add back depreciation. And depreciation shouldn't have been covered, should have been covered in your finance class or accounting class. And basically why we add that back is because it's a non-cash charge. Depreciation is a trick on the IRS. So we take away depreciation to lower our net income. So we pay less taxes. But that we really didn't pay any money. It's a, it's a trick. It's an accounting trick. It's illegal. It's not illegal. It's a, you're allowed to do this. But depreciation lowers your net income. We add it back to create the cash flow uh, because, it's more, because it's really cash that we have. If you have a problem with this depreciation concept, this is not the class for me to explain it to you. You should ask your finance professor, and if you didn't cover it in your finance class, email them and say, hey, we're in, I'm in my investment class, we're talking about depreciation, why didn't you cover this? Or your accounting class as well. Or maybe they did cover it, you missed that day or you don't remember it, so go back to your old textbooks. Or if you don't have them because you sold them back, go online and there's 9,670,000 sites that will explain depreciation to you as far as it relates to cash flow. Okay. Um, so with the free cash flow to the firm, we're looking at, um, we're, we're making a, a different pathway to cash flow, but something that's more relatable to, to the firm's amount of money. And, and from this, we're gonna subtract, again, the uh, change in working capital uh, minus any capital expenditures. And working capital is another terminology that you should come into the class already knowing. Working capital is um, money that you put into the business. So if you expand your inventories, if you expand, say for example, you, you normally keep $100 in your cash registers every day, but now you want to keep $200 in that cash register. Well, that's a change in working capital. You're not really spending that money or losing that money, you're just putting it back into the business and that comes out of your cash flow. So if you have a cash account, and you need to withdraw money so you can put more money in your cash registers to make change for people, now your cash account's gonna look less, your cash flow is less because you're putting that money, that cash into the business. Okay. Um, okay, so when you use per share measures, so we could take the cash flow and divide it by the outstanding shares of the company to get cash flow per stock, per share. 
and then we could use those cash flows per share to do a discounting model or use some of those discounting formulas and substitute cash flow for dividends. So instead of looking at dividends in those models, you put in the cash flow per share. So if I'm going to buy a business, if I'm going to buy a laundromat, I, wa I don't want to know, I go up to the laundromat and I say, well, what is your net income? They say, well, we, we've had a, a loss every year for the past three years. I said, well, why would I want to buy this business? Oh, because the cash flow is $100,000 a year and that's what you're really going to make. Well, then how do you show a loss? Oh, that's easy. I have a really good accountant. He comes in. I depreciate all my washing machines and I depreciate, you know, um, and I have all this other investments in the company and, and it looks like I have a loss, but I really am making $100,000. That's not to mention the money that I'm skimming from the cash that I'm not reporting to the government and that's another $50,000 you'll make. But we're not going to tell the government about that because that's a joke. You don't have to laugh. But most cash businesses, they don't report all the cash they're collecting, which is illegal. But suddenly when they decide to sell the company, all of a sudden you look, and I've, I've valued these companies for people, and, I, and you look, it's so funny, you say, okay, for 10 years there wasn't much growth. All of a sudden the last two years there's a 50% growth in their revenue. And what that basically is, the business isn't expanding. They're just reporting all the cash now because they want the value of the business to seem better so they can sell it for more money. Um, okay, so this is a way of making those, those models more updated by taking away dividends and putting in a cash flow per share. And just also using a very simplistic discounted cash flow, if we know a business generates $100,000 of cash flow a year, and we say that, you know, I would like to pay myself back for my investment within four years for a slow growth business like a laundromat, that seems fair. So then the value of the laundromat would be that dis discounting that $100,000 every year for four years and adding that together. So it could be maybe you know, 95,000 plus 90,000 plus 85,000 plus 80,000 because the last fourth year is going to be discounted the most. Add those four numbers together and that's the, the value of the business or what you would pay for it today if you were to buy it. You know, and so laundromats are four times cash flow, but you know, hot computer companies may be 15 times cash flow. Because you always have to look at the industry and the risk associated with it to be the amount of times cash flow you can charge. Okay, so intrinsic value, basically what intrinsic value is really the fair value or the, or the accurate value of a company. And so we're looking for the objective of this fundamental analysis is to figure out what is the real fair value of this company. So, you know, a value that if I bought it, I'm getting a fair price. Just like if you go to buy a car, you're going to do some research to see the intrinsic value of the car. You're going to go to Kelly's Blue Book. You're going to go maybe on Craigslist or look at some advertisements and figure out what is the, you know, a fair value for this car based on its condition, its mileage and its make and model, and you want to pay a fair price if you're going to buy a used car. And you work very hard to make sure that you're not going to pay more than the car is worth. You know, but maybe in some cases you find a car you could pay less for because the, the owner selling it is in a rush or really doesn't, has enough money, isn't too worried about it, and just, you know, it's really worth it's a $10,000 vehicle, but they're selling it for $7,000. And that's something you buy right away. In fact, there's whole groups of people that go on Craigslist looking for used cars to sell to figure out what the valuations are or what they can sell them at, buy them off Craigslist and put them on a used car lot and sell them at a 30% markup. Uh, that's also why if you ever trade your car in, you're going to buy a new car and you trade your old car into the dealer, you're going to get a lower value for that car than if you sell it privately. You know, because the dealer is, dealer knows what the actual fair value or intrinsic value of the car is, but he's not interested in paying you the intrinsic value because there's no profit for him. He wants to pay below intrinsic value so he can resell it at intrinsic value or higher to make a profit. So again, it's common sense. If, if the intrinsic value um, is, is, is larger than the current stock price, so if the intrinsic value is $20 and the stock price is 10 that's something you want to look at buying. But if it's the other way, the intrinsic value, the real fair value of a company is $10, but it's trading at $25 that might be something that you would have to think about carefully because it's trading really a, a lot, a, a premium above its intrinsic value. Uh, so this is, intrinsic value gives the point of what the company's really worth and then you decide, um, 
by looking at the current stock price if it's worth it to buy it. In some cases, you may want to pay a little bit above intrinsic value because the company has good future percent potential. You know. So everything's an estimate, though. So there's really no, no magic number. This is all sort of estimated numbers and guidelines to get you to, you know, even though if you, you calculate the intrinsic value and the stock price is much lower, there's things you may not know. Maybe the company's about to go bankrupt. You know, maybe there's a big lawsuit they're about to lose. Uh, so these are things, there's more to it than just these numbers. You also always have to be very intimate with the company and its business model and what's happening with it in the real world. Now, alternative approach is the P.E. ratio or the earnings multiplier approach. And this is something everybody should have in their report. So every report should have a discounted cash flow model, and it all should include a P.E. or earnings multiple approach in valuing the stock. And this P.E. approach is very common. It's, so the discounted cash flow model and the P.E. Um, model are two models that analysts currently always use. Um, and this is probably most often used, very common, because it's very easy and simple. Um, so the P.E. ratio is the strength which investors are putting on the value of the stock's earnings. So when we look at P.E., it's simply the price of the stock divided by the earnings per share. So you have a $25 stock and you have $5 earnings per share, you have a P.E. of 5, which is very low. Because the market average is usually 15 in, in a, um, is, is a, the average of most of the markets. So a P.E. of low is very, a P.E. of five is very low. That could be a, a real potential good value to buy, you know. Uh, it's like you go to your store that you want to buy these pair of shoes, and for some reason that week they have a 50% off sale. So you're feeling like I'm getting a great value because I was really prepared to pay the full price. And that's sort of what we're trying to look for, stocks on some kind of discount. <clears throat> So if you divide the you know, current market price of the stock by the, uh, the 12 months earnings per share, um, and then we get this multiple. Now, what's interesting about this multiple is it's sort of the willingness of people to pay for the stock. So if a stock has a PE of 20, investors are currently willing to pay 20 times earnings. So what do you think will happen if earnings go from $1 to $2? Is the stock price going to remain the same? No, the stock price is, is likely to double if earnings double. You know, the PE, and a lot of times the PE does maintain or grow if the earnings are growing. So if the PE is 20 and that they double their earnings, not only will you, you know, the PE likely to stay 20, it may actually go higher to 21 or 22 because it's a growing company. So that's why if you can accurately estimate next year's earnings and you use a conservative PE, uh, you, can, you can very well figure out what next year's stock price will be. And companies do release their earnings analysis and expectations for the next year. So when they do their quarterly reports, they will give you projections. This is what we project our revenues to be and our profits to be and our earnings to be. And companies generally do, on a consistent basis, meet or exceed those earnings. So if you know, if you have an expected PE and you have the expected earnings per share from the company, that they're committed to meeting or beating, you have a really good idea of what the stock price is. But the problem is everybody has this information, so it's quickly built into the price of the stock. So that's why when earnings trade, earnings come out, the stock, tr tr the stock trades a little bit more, um, moves a little bit more quickly because it's readjusting quickly because of the new earnings situation. And it's why if companies don't improve or meet their earnings per share expectations, the stock price goes down dramatically because you've really disappointed investors and they've losing faith in you and your PE level may decline now because of this and your earnings are certainly declining. So a company missing their earnings targets is really devastating to the stock price. You know, so that's really the, the biggest, I'm always surprised when, you know, some finance students don't realize that you know, what you're doing in finance is, is helping companies to maximize their wealth and maximize their earnings per share. And, you know, so you always have to be focused on profit margins. And the whole stock market is focused on profit margin. If a company comes out and their profit margins start to fall backwards, investors get very concerned. Companies need to be constantly managing their profit margins. And if, if it looks like costs are going up, they need to raise prices or cut their costs somehow. To, to maintain those profit margins. 
Okay, so again, these, these, these calculations are, are fairly easy. You know, we get, if we want to have um, an estimate, we want to look at, first we have to develop an estimate of what the PE is going to be for next year, and then an estimate of what the earnings per share will be for next year, and you just multiply the two together. So earnings, earnings one mean earnings next year, and we can multiply that by the price of the stock divided by earnings one, and that will give our justified PE ratio. And the PE ratio can be derived from um, I mean, these are formulas you could use to derive the P-E ratio. Typically, I think the best way of deriving the P-E ratio is looking at what the P-E is right now. To be, and being, I mean, you could estimate the P-E will be higher based on growth and dividends or earnings, and that what these models are doing down here is saying that we expect price or P-E to be higher. First here, we could estimate price, and then estimate P-E, then we can, you know, but I always feel a conservative P-E estimate is the current year's P-E ratio. Even though if earnings or dividends do go off, the P-E the P ratio should increase. And, but some analysts may use an increased P-E model or just be more conservative and use the current year's P-E to multiply against the earnings. So, but, and again, we'll practice these calculations on a later date. But these formulas are fairly simplistic. All we're doing here is dividing and multiplying. You know? So as long as you can derive the inputs, these formulas are relatively simple. But the real basic part of this formula is just next year's P-E ratio multiplied by next year's expected earnings. Very simple. Uh, so any stock analysis report would be immediately flagged as garbage if they didn't have some sort of model a PE approach to valuing the stock within the model, within their analysis. So the higher the, the payout ratio, the higher the justified PE, meaning that the more money the company is going to pay out as dividends, the higher portion of earnings they pay as dividends, the higher the PE, because the more valuable the stock to investors. Um, the higher the growth rate, that, which is G, um, the higher the justified P-E ratio as well. So if growth rates of companies increase, P-E ratios increase. So if you look at the stock market, companies with low growth projections generally have low P-E's. Companies with very high growth projections, uh, there's where you have the P-E's that, you know, if the market is an average of 15, maybe right now it's 18, the current market, uh, stocks that have real good growth potential, they're trading at 25, 30, 40 times earnings. Their PEs are up to 40. And some stocks with very slow or sluggish expected growth rates are 12, 11 PE ra ratios. So growth has a lot to do with the, the change in the PE multiple. The higher the required rate of return, the lower the PE. Remember, required rate of return, or K, or discount rate, or cost of capital, um, the higher this number is, this percentage, the more risk in, involved in the stock. And the more risk, the lower the PE. So PE multiple is going to decrease with slower growth and more risk will push the PE multiple down, which pushes the stock price down. PE multiple increase with higher payouts, higher growth, less risk. The stock becomes more valuable. The PE is going to increase because as stock price increases, and it's divided by earnings, it's going to, that's just going to be a natural increase in the price of the, of, I mean, the PE multiple. Now, PE multiple is, or PE ratio is probably one of the most important ratios to understand. And it's easy to calculate, but it's really important to understand how sensitive it is in the marketplace, how it fluctuates differently for different industries uh, and different companies as well. So, you know, firms can increase the payout ratio to increase the market price or the price of the stock. Um, but, however, sometimes rapid growth can affect, affect the riskiness of earnings. And there's a classic model of um, Boston market at one time was as hot as Chipotle's is today. Lines around the corner, you know, every restaurant, you know, having, topping their sales estimates or revenues estimates, and they had an extreme growth, and they borrowed a lot of money to put a lot of restaurants up in a very short amount of time, and they overreach and create 
a financial riskiness. Their interest on the amount of money they borrowed was, was greater than the additional profits they were making. So rapid growth can affect the riskiness of earnings. Um, and that's going to affect you know, the required return because it's riskier. Um, and then it can in, in turn can affect the, the, um, the growth and the risk will affect the PE multiple. So at one point you had, at that time it was called Boston Chicken when it was public, and you had a, a PE of 150, but quickly when analysts started discovering that they were borrowing in a very risky, very high interest rate way, that the new restaurants that were open would never be able to make a profit based on the high rates of interest that they were bar borrowing, and the new restaurants weren't as, invaluable, as valuable locations were putting, putting up so, so fast. They really started to see a lot of risk in the market and they started selling the company and then the company just went bankrupt and later McDonald's bought them and and then spun them off to private equity again at a later point but you know that's a classic case of how PE multiples you know skyrocketed with the growth potential of the company but then came right back down once the risks were fully exposed uh, and it ultimately led to the bankruptcy of the company. Now uh, if we're in an environment where interest rates may increase over the next 36 months as the Federal Reserve and look to increase rates. Uh, how does it affect the PE ratios? Now, a lot of the PE ratios are pure optimism and pessimism with stock goers. So if you have a growth bull market, a growing market and a bull market like we have now, PE multiples generally, like a tide, tend to increase for all companies. As investors are, are feeling comfortable in putting more money into the marketplace and buying more stock and creating more demand to buy stock, that's going to push up stock prices. And if earnings aren't changing as fast as the stock prices are, we're going to have higher PE multiples. Uh, so as interest rates increase though, however, um, P multiples are going to decrease because it's going to make things riskier for companies. So P multiples and interest rates are related to each other indirectly. But you, in, in, as interest rates increase, consumers now have more interest to pay or it's riskier for them or it's harder for them to get a certain amount of credit and the money that they do borrow they're paying more interest on so they have less money to spend can hurt a business because consumers will have less money because the interest is more expensive. And for businesses, their borrowing costs increase. So this is going to lower, you know, make the market a little bit more pessimistic about stocks futures and PE multiples generally go down. So right now, we've had a steadily increasing PE multiple over the last five years as interest rates have been going lower and stock market has been increasing. But that could change as the interest rates start to increase. Other multiples you should look at, one is called price to book. Uh, now, Price to book value, we look at the stock price related to the book value per share. Book value per share is very simply assets minus liabilities equals equity. So you take all the assets of the company, you minus all the liabilities, you're left with the equity of a company. Just like if you owned a house, you say my house is worth 400000 I owe $250,000 in the house, so my equity is really only 150000 so you look at the true equity of the company and divide that by the amount of outstanding shares and that's what we call book value per share. The actual value of the company, the actual amount of money you would get if the company closed its doors, sold all its assets, paid off all its liabilities and returned whatever money was left over per share to shareholders. So it's how much money you'd see and generally this is lower than the stock price. So, so in, the, in, the, in the industry we could look at what's the stock price related to the book value. And you may have um, a constant, you may have an average of this. So the book value, the stock price is usually two times the book value. So if the book value is $10, the stocks are trading at $20. So suddenly you find that, what if you find a stock in this industry where the, um, the stock price is, is only trading, you know, um, not 100% of book value, but 50% of book value. So it's, you could say that that might be a value situation. However, generally I found where we have a, a, a shrinking relationship between the price of the stock and the book value, meaning that they're closer together, the book value and the price of the stock are not that far apart. Generally there's some sort of reason where there's a new competitor or there's a the problem with the business or a lawsuit or something that's depressing the price of the stock and making it 
become closer to book value. And generally, 95% of all companies trade above their book value. Very few companies trade at or below their book value. Because if the company's trading below the book value, then you just buy the entire company, sell all the assets, pay all the debt, and you make a profit. So that's why companies don't trade. And the companies that do trade below book value, or if, or if the companies are improperly valued, and someone realizes that, they will buy it and cut it up and sell the assets to make you know, the difference between book value and stock price. But again, each industry has a different relationship of the percentage of stock price to the book value. So you have, that's why we're, you're creating these spreadsheets so you can kind of come up with these numbers and see what the, the industry is, and then you could judge what is undervalued. Now, price to sales ratio, this is important for companies that don't have profits. So we could look at the stock price in relationship to the sales per share. Take the total revenues divided by outstanding shares, you get your sales per share. So it's a market valuation of the revenue. So if you're looking to buy, say you're looking at um, a retail industry and you want to know how many sales are tied to each share of stock. Well, you buy a share of this retailer, every share of stock, we have a price to sales ratio of three. So the stock price trades at three times the sales per share. That's, that could be high. Maybe there's another retailer which is only two times, which that might be a better value. So you, um, you want to look at this relationship of stock price to sales. And I, um, the best situation is where the, um, the sales per share is closer to the stock price per share. It's more valuable. Because you don't want to have a stock price of 100 supported by sales per share of $20 per share. Because it just doesn't make sense. I'd much rather have a stock that has revenues of $100 per share and a stock price of $20 per share. That makes more sense. Because even though you have a revenue of $100, that can mean vastly, thing, vastly different profits to vastly different companies. Some companies with a, a high uh, profit margin, that could be $50 of profits for $100 worth of sales. And some companies, it could be $3 of profit for $100 worth of sales, let's say a supermarket. They may only make $3 for every $100 of revenue. So that's why it's industry specific. All right. there, there is this other new approach, relatively new, called economic value added. And this is something that I'll explain the concept, but it's better to look at the calculations. But it's a newer technique, and what we're doing is we're looking at the actual value created or economic value created by the business. So we want to look at the difference between the operating profits and the company's true cost of capital for both its debt and equity. So we take the profits of the company and we want to subtract the cost of debt and equity. So debt has a cost that's very definable because it's the, the dividend or the interest you pay on that debt. So it's easy to calculate the cost of debt. The cost of equity is sort of that capital asset pricing model or the required rate of return. The K is really considered the cost of stock. So we look at the, all the, these inputs, you, you get your company is made up by money raised from dividend, from, sorry, from bonds and from stock. So the money that was raised, that's the capital investors gave you to run a company. And that capital has a cost. So if you take your earnings um, and you subtract out the cost of that capital, you get a real true economic value added, as, as they call it. Uh, so if the difference is positive, meaning that you've created more value than the cost of the capital, you've created actual value for your company. Um, so it's a, it's a truer measure of profitability, and it makes it a more, simple, a more simple calculation. And again, something we'll explore in a handout. Uh, so if we look at the formula for calculating EVA, we take the net operating profits after taxes, or what's called as abbreviation NOPAT, and we, we want to look at the net oper, um, operating profits or, op, you know, sometimes simply called EBIT or operating profits, but we want to take taxes away from that. So it's not net profits. That's taxes, interest taken away. We want to look at the, the operational profits of the company, take away the taxes, and then take away the cost of capital. And that will tell us if we actually created some value above the cost of the capital. So it's a good measure of financial performance and wealth created by a company um, that's not 
And that's why we work with operational profits, not net profits, because net profits, we're taking away taxes, and we're taking away depreciation, and we're taking away um, interest, and it's just not a truer picture. So this gives you a truer picture of, and I've, if you go to the, um, these PowerPoints, there's a, a link here, you could, there's a little video from Investopedia that explains this um, with some graphics, a different perspective on it. So, if, so if I would recommend watching that as well as, I mean, we're going to discuss it again and, have, and work on this again, but it's, it's something that I, I think your report should include. It's a, good it's a good additional measure. So going back to the original argument, what is the best approach? Um, I feel from my background that the discounted cash flow technique um, is the best approach uh, in valuing a stock. I mean, earnings multiples and relative valuation techniques like EVA are good, and I think they all should be done. You should do all three of these valuations, discounted cash flow, earnings multiples, and relative valuation to look at the company from three different perspectives. But if you go to a corporate world, you know, come out of the stock investing, stock analyst world, you go to a corporate world, uh, as corporate valuations go, we use discounted cash flow. If we're going to buy another company, you know, and working for being a financial manager of companies, you know, I was involved in analyzing the value of the companies. The way we do it in the corporate world is we look at valuing the cash flow. Because to us, and if you look at even a small scale, a small investor buying a local laundromat, liquor store, pizza shop, you go with cash flow as well. Because you don't have these other stock multiples and things to look at, cash flow is the purest way, discounted cash flow is really the purest way. Uh, the only thing tricky with the discounted cash flow is how many years are appropriate for the business. That's the one real subjective point is how many years do I want to, how many years of cash flow do I want to add together? Five, 10, 15? It depends on the industry. And that's why you need a lot of people buying these companies need financial analysts to say, who, who specialize in this to say, okay, for this industry, typically companies pay eight times earnings. And this is, so this is what we believe is a fair price for the business. 800 million would be a fair price for buying the business. Let's offer them 600 million and see what they say. Just like if you were gonna buy a house, you figure out what you feel is the true value of the house and you, you see if you underbid, see if you could buy it for less. So you can create some instant value when you suddenly own it. So conceptually, the best estimate of the current values of the company's uh, common stock is what I feel is the present value of its cash flows generated from that company. Now, when I say cash flows, we're not using dividends anymore. We would use the cash flow per share variables. Um, and that's what most analysts respect uh, at, at, when you write down to the bones of your analysis report, you really should base a good percentage of your choice on the discounted cash flow model. But you do need to have those multiple earnings or relative valuation techniques to support that. So it's great to say that this piece of evidence says the value of the company is this, but I can support that with these additional valuation models also, sh also uh, support the conclusion. So you're building a case. So a lot of these analysis reports, analyst reports, is you building a case to convince someone to buy or sell a stock. So the more arguments you have, the more likely you are to win a case. It's sort of like a law case. You have to come in and say, you don't want to build your whole case just on one argument. If you have multiple arguments or multiple witnesses you know, corroborating the fact of the valuation of this company, you're more likely to write a very persuasive uh, analyst report. Now, hopefully your recommendation actually becomes uh, fulfilled and correct, and that's as an analyst how you build a reputation that your reports lead to successful investing. Um, now, the PE multiple approach that I spend a lot of time talking about is very easy to use, um, and it's a very, a very good approach for a quick analysis. But that should always be included as well. The PE multiple approach um, is, I think, a lot more accurate than any of the dividend valuation models. You know, the PE is something that, in the investing world, everybody understands PE. Everybody has an innate sense of it. So it's always important to include that in any valuation report. Um, now, it is always important to also spell out or to warn investors that you're dealing with uncertainties in the future. 
the economy, competition. Uh, so when you calculate the intrinsic value of a company, it's an estimate um, no more, no less. It's never really promised to be an exact figure that this is you know, what's going to happen. It's your best guess and it's subject to error and any, any really good investment report analyst will, will state at the end of the report somewhere in the risk section that you know, this is all based on data derived from the company and the current economic conditions and there is a chance that you know, these estimates or predictions will not come to fruition uh, and this you know, may not actually be um, how accurate, an accurate valuation of this company moving forward. You know, um, now, kind of just one interesting thing to talk about. In the year, um, we had a couple bubbles in the last decade, 2000 and 2008. And we had this bubble, new bubble economy in the year, like the late 1990s, early 2000s, where analysts and investors, they didn't want to talk about earnings per share or cash flows or PE ratios. They want to talk about a new fantasy world where these companies' variables didn't exist. That there's a new, because of the internet and the cause of the way these new internet companies are being made, a new, the new realities of the productivity of the economy, that we can't look at these old valuation models anymore. They're no good. We now have to live in a new world. And in this new world, we have PEs of 150 for, you know, um, Cisco and 650 for Yahoo and 640 for JDS Uniphase and in this new world this is possible and that's that's the story analysts are trying to say to everybody so in the year 2000 all these reports were coming in Yahoo at 150 had 50 uh, 25 to 50 analysts saying buy no one saying sell Yahoo and with a year later it's trading at you know $35 a share and uh, uh, not much lo longer than that it's $12 a share so in every time in history where people tried to move away from looking at earnings per share, cash flows, or PE ratios because they didn't like the fact that it grounded the stocks to a lower price, that's pretty much where anybody can determine when a bubble is formulating. So when the, the multiple valuations far exceed the, the historical norms in PE and uh, cash flow and earnings per share re uh, relative measures, that's when you can say the market is really disconnecting from the valuation or the intrinsic value of the stocks. And when you see that disconnect, you know that you're in a bubble phase. I saw that quite, it, it's easier to explain to people in the, in the real estate world. When you look at a house and they're saying this house costs a million dollars, but you say to yourself, does, you know, does all the nails and the boards and the appliances and the flooring and the light fixtures and the sheetrock, does all of that add up to ignoring the cost of the land, saying the land is a separate price? Does all that add up? If I was to build a brand new house today with all these materials, would there be any close, anywhere close to a million dollars? And you actually do the estimate, and I found, okay, to get all that done with the labor is $200,000. Why am I paying an $800,000 premium? Because the real estate became disconnected to the true values of the home. So the home has a, a value that's first based on the value of the land and the location of the land. Real estate's all about location. And then the actual value of the house, the size of the house and the components and the materials inside the house. So there's a true valuation you can put on a home. In a bubble situation, the house price trades at two, three times that valuation. And that's how you know you're in a bubble, because you're saying it's, there's no way the house is worth that much. You know, and there's times when the stock prices, you go, there's just no way the stock is, stocks are worth that much. And that's as, a, as an experienced investor, you say, okay, now's the time for me to pull back in stocks a bit, maybe put more money in bonds or more money in cash because this market is crazy. Um, but I'm not advocating market timing. We'll talk more about um, trading strategies in a later chapter. But sometimes when things look really crazy and they feel crazy to you, it may be a time to be independent and think, okay, I know everybody's saying that this is accurate and true and this is how it is, but is it really? And a few people like Warren Buffett and a few people back in 1999, year 2000, were really warning about this and saying that this is ridiculous. You know, if you look out through history and historic norms, this is not normal. But people had a good way, a very convincing way of convincing themselves that these prices were normal and convincing small investors to keep investing more money in these uh, outrageously bubbled markets because they didn't know any better. They just listened to these analysts. So that's why it's always important to do your own analysis and get your own true perspective rather than listen to anybody else because they may, you know, they may be drinking from the same um, 
confusing potion that everybody else is drinking from. And they're all regurgitating what they're saying anyway. So that's why your original analysis is more important than anything you could buy or read from somebody else. Because it's not that difficult to do it. And it's generally a more clearer perspective than um, a lot of the analysis that's currently out there. Okay. Um, so anyway, as it went, the bubbles burst in uh, March of 2000, continued to horrific declines in 2001 and 2002, and a lot of these new economy stocks went bankrupt or lost 80% of their value. And then we had a few years where the stock market was okay, and in 2008, 2009, we had a huge bubble burst due to the real estate bubble. And the, the thing to look out for now is are we entering in a new bubble based on these low interest rate environment and stock Stock valuations are starting to pull away from average norms. So we could possibly be entering into another bubble phase. I'm not afraid of that because if we are moving into another bubble phase, that's a great time to be invested in stocks because the stock prices are going to be, become overly inflated and more valuable than, you know, just like you want to own a house before the housing bubble occurred, the trick is pulling back before it pops. And that's the thing that very few people are able to do. And here's just an example of a few, a few stocks that are gone, like eToys, $247 million worth of debt before it even made any profits, gone. Pets.com, um, gone. A learning company, um, uh, bought by Mattel for $3.5 billion, sold for $27 million in 2000, only a few years later. GeoCities, purchased by Yahoo for $3.6 billion. Uh, then closed in 2009. So you look at some of these purchases today of these big companies buying Facebook, buying Oculus, um, uh, people looking at buying, making offers for billions of dollars for a company like Snapchat and different things. Uh, you see some of these simil similarities between the internet bubble of 2000 and some of the internet craziness that's going on with some of the valuations of small companies with no profits that people are offering billions of dollars to. Um, these are examples of some other companies. Now, um, Infospace, uh, Webvan, some of these you may not recognize because they were either purchased by other companies or just bankrupt for many years. But that's something you may want to, as personal interest, go and investigate and look at that stock market bubble of the year 2000, what led up to it and what were the end results after it. It's quite an interesting history of the stock market value. It's an important lesson on why you should never give up on the true valuation methods of calculating intrinsic value uh, for a company.